episode 65 with John McEwen. You'll know him as one of the founding members of the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Uh, he's a multi-instrumentalist, plays banjo, acoustic guitar, fiddle, uh, lap steel. There's a whole whack of instruments. Super talented uh, and such a nice guy, too. I had a great conversation. I couldn't believe uh, looking over his bio and looking over his career, uh, everything he's done. Uh, it's truly amazing, and it's a worthwhile listen to this one. And make sure you check out his uh, his book. He's got a new album out as well, and uh, all worthwhile uh, checking out. Also, don't forget about my sponsors for the podcast, Music City Canada, based out of London. Great music store. They have everything you can ever imagine. I buy tons of stuff there. You can check them out at musiccitycanadahere.com. Also, Morning Buzz Coffee. Uh, that's morningbuzzcoffee.buzz, and they're based out of Hamilton, owned by a couple of great musicians and uh, you can buy all their product they'll ship it right to you fantastic guys and stick man clothing company based out of regina saskatchewan and they have fantastic stuff make sure you check out all their clothing and all their cool things they sell you can check that out here as well all right this is john McHugh, and make sure if you like this podcast hit the subscribe button if you're watching on youtube if you're listening to uh, itunes or spotify any of those great platforms make sure you subscribe and see all the other great podcasts available to you all right john McHugh. all right we are live here with uh a wonderful gentleman john McEwen, and he just moved into franklin tennessee from florida and uh it's been busy moving so i appreciate you taking your time and and doing the podcast me it's nice to have you on here that's why your place looks so much nicer than my place right now, which is nothing but boxes and things. But it's coming together. We've only been here one day. Oh wow, that's uh, that's a lot to uh, to take in. You got boxes and everything, and figuring out a place to put everything. But why not, right? Yeah, and why not Nashville? I've been coming to this town for fifty-five years. Yeah, and you never uh, lived there. And never lived here. I've, yeah. I've, I've been here uh, almost two years of my life in hotels and things of that nature, do either recording or playing with Nitty Gritty Dirt Band or yeah. recording with Nitty Gritty Dirt Band or other people. I've made a few solo albums, String Wizards albums. I did uh, some of that work here and sat in with other people. And it's quite so, why not? Why not? Nash, yeah. The final quarter of my game, I've always heard that the best, well, not that I've always seen that the best part of a game is the final quarter. Yeah. So I came here to play it out. Excellent. Well, how, uh, how you've been faring with everything that's happened over the last year? I know it's, it's been, what's it's been crazy, hasn't it? What, what, what's well, happened? Well, with COVID. <laughs> there's, there's a list, isn't there? <laughs> I don't know. Has anything happened? This year is not starting off so great either, but. Uh, I'm, I'm actually having a, a good year. One of the reasons for deciding to move was, was it was time. It was a good place to be and we don't know where it's going, but it's going to get better. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm going to be here to be ready for it. And the, I've been getting ready by getting, uh, I have about five projects that are kind of on getting completed yeah. as, as we speak, kind of. And so... Uh, you don't seem to slow down very much, do you? Pardon? You don't seem to slow down very much. Well, you got to go faster in one lane if that lane you're in is slow or what? It, yeah, you just got to find something to do. I'm not going to go, oh, no. Yeah. I mean, when I started in this business, there wasn't anywhere to play anyway. You, could, you know, there was very few venues. There was maybe, uh, well, in the 60s, there wasn't, there, there was a few clubs. Yeah. The Ice House in Glendale, the Troubadour, the Ash Grove, the Golden Bear. That's in Southern California yeah. where, where I started. And there were people already playing there, and you're new, and they don't 
So you got to get in there you, anyway. You got to do something, yeah. you know. And if you do good, they might have you back in a couple months. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, when the band started, when Nitty Gritty Dirt Band started, uh, I was the oldest one. I was 21 years old when we had our first hit. I was 20 when I when we started the group. And uh, let's see, Les was 16. Wow. Jeff was 18. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jimmy Fadden was 17 or... Anyway, just a bunch of kids. We didn't. We knew twelve songs. <laughs> you know? we, we made our first album. We left out two of them, and uh, <laughs> and the first album had a had a radio record on it, a hit. That's fabulous. Well, let's go back even just before that. I know it's an interesting story because you were uh, working as in the magic shop in in Disney, oh. were you not? Yeah, uh, my dream job. I was 16 years old trying to get a job in the, the magic shop which, in Disneyland, which is in Anaheim. Yeah. A couple miles from my house. And Steve Martin and I were both trying to get this, the, the job. Yeah. Well, we both got the job wow. the same day. And, we, and it was like we celebrated by having lunch in Tomorrowland. <laughs> So you did you have a fascination with with magic growing up as a kid? From the time of around 13, 14 years old, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was a dork. I was a nerd. I was a a dork that graduated to nerd by high school. Yeah. And, and but when you did magic stuff, when you could go fool somebody, it gave you an edge. Yeah. You know. I was nervous as a cat, but it still, and started with my aunt and my grandma and stuff like that. But let's have let's have Johnny do a trick, you know. <laughs> yeah. So. It's interesting how many musicians and performers I know that are into magic. Um, I, one of my good friends up here in Canada uh, is, and his friend, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Steve Warner, which you you all know. Um, I found out today that he lives about a block away from me. Oh, I know exactly where you are then. I've been to Steve's house. What about Steve? He's totally into magic. From how long? Since he's little. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So you should reach out. <laughs> you, you probably have a great conversation about magic there. Cause, uh, I remember that. yeah, yeah. He's really been, uh, we did a podcast together just, uh, a month or so ago and, uh, we chatted about that in the podcast. So. Um, but yeah, I know several, uh, musicians that are, are into, into magic or started when they were young. It was part of their, you know, they're doing some magic and some music as well. So, well, magic, when, when I was doing it, you know, it's a close up kind, you're doing card tricks or whatever, <clears throat> Disneyland, the three years I spent there got me into performing because you, you do little shows all day long yeah all day long is sometimes eight eight hours at least but usually 10 or 12 sometimes 14 hour days and uh people would come through the shop you know walking through and they'd be looking in the, at, the, at the display case what's that uh what's that nickels to dimes do nickels to dimes oh, yeah. <laughs> Wants to know about nickels to dimes, something yeah. we would all like to do. Yeah. You know, you start drawing in some people, and you do a little twenty-minute pitch, and then it's also for sale. And it would you need to sell a bunch of stuff, and if if it didn't go right, there'd be another crowd in twenty minutes. Yeah, another group, maybe a crowd of two or three people, or maybe fifteen or twenty, and. Uh, it really made me not want to work for a living. Yeah. I'm going to do this, do that kind of thing. And music, when music came along when I was 17 and a half. Yeah. 15, it's the same way. You don't, you sit at home and you practice and you practice and you get good at something or you don't know if you're good, but you have to find somebody to, to play for. Yes. Hey, listen to this song, you know, 
see if you can uh, connect that way. And th that's that mystery of why do performers go on the road? Hmm. Yeah. Why, when you're sitting at home, do you choose to go to Omaha to have some guy that owns a club say, uh, I can't pay you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I can only pay you half as much, or you did really well, whatever. The thousands of things that you hear. You go to Omaha, Lincoln, Nebraska, Missouri, Kentucky, you know. You drive around trying to pick up money yeah. for what you do. You're sitting there. You're sitting there in your nice studio. You play the fiddle, right? Yep, exactly. You play the fiddle, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've toured a lot, so I know what that's like. Um, Who have you toured? What's that? Who have you, with whom have you toured? Um, well, I've, I performed with my family for gosh, 40 something years now. Um, wow. and we've toured all over North America and then I've performed with a lot of Canadian artists and everyone from Shania Twain down to different ones, uh, throughout Canada here as well. And then I am a promoter as well. So I've, I've worked on the road and, and done a bunch of stuff as a, a behind the scenes guy. So, um, I've seen all of, all of the United States and all of Canada multiple, multiple times. It's just like you have. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's something that even now there's a part of me that loves being at home, um, with, you know, no shows really happening. Um, but there's, man, I sure miss it. Um, and there, it, it doesn't leave you. I mean, it's, it's nice to kind of have this extra time that you never had at home to do these extra things, but man, I'm, I'm pretty anxious to, to be doing something again. You can't do the magic trick in front of the mirror all the time. <laughs> you, you know, I was speaking with a friend today cause I'm not sure about you. I like, I love playing, uh, it's just a part of me, but I love playing with a group of people um, mm -hmm. and I love a crowd. And I'm not much for just sitting at home and just playing, right? Um, yeah. I, it's okay, but it doesn't do much for me. I get bored, like 10 minutes and I'm 15 minutes and I'm I'm kind of, okay, that's enough for me. <laughs> I need I need a crowd, I want someone to play off of or that interaction. Um, but just sitting by myself, I, for me, I've never, that's, it's always been a struggle. Um, I don't know about you on, on that type of thing, but. COVID, the COVID thing, <clears throat> mm -hmm. it first started happening early last summer, whenever. Yeah. I'm going to have a lot of time to practice. This month I've played maybe eight hours, you know, yeah. I was getting ready to move and stuff. I was packing boxes and things before the move, but I just didn't want to open the case. Yeah. Because whatever I worked up and figured out, there's no one to show it to. Yeah. But then I do have the desire. I have come up with some good things, and it's kind of a half-and-half half thing. Yeah. It's... That's why I like doing the podcasts. Yeah, it's 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 a great interaction with people that you're used to hanging with, right? It different. Oh, hey, come out of my computer. Come <laughs> <I know. on. laughs> so let's go back to to being in California. You're, you're working at Disney with with Steve Martin of all people. Um, you guys went to school. Um, so that was the uh, summer before our senior year. Yeah. And we spent our senior year in high school together. And music hadn't really come along yet. So what, what made you uh, go with learning the banjo? What was the drive there? You ever heard of the Dillards? Yep. The Dillards were somebody I'd never heard of. And it, when I was 17 and a half, somebody said, we're going to go to this club and see the Dillards. I says, what's a Dillard? And I went with them, and I sat there, and I watched, and they came out, and I just went. Yeah. I wow. sat there, and I went, uh, how do you? I went backstage 
I knocked on the door, uh, and Rodney Dillard let me in. And he's a lifetime friend, by the way. Rodney Dillard's got a new album out, oh, Old wow. Road, New Road. Good to pick up if you've ever heard of the Dillards or wonder what they what became of them. Yeah. But uh, Rodney was very cordial, and I followed the Dillards around. Remember, I mentioned the clubs in Southern California, right? Yeah. We're up in 1964 or five now. Well, there was the they'd play the Ice House in Pasadena. Yeah. Down there, they'd play the Huntington Beach Golden Bear. Then they'd be back up the next week. You know, they week long gigs Tuesday through Sunday. Then they'd be up at the Troubadour oh. for a week, and then maybe the maybe the Ash Grove or uh, the Mecca then in Buena Park. Yeah, and I'd go see see them at all of them. Yeah. At least I'd catch a couple nights a week. Yeah, my mother thought my, my mother thought my name. Why don't you change your last name to Dillard? You know. <laughs> I would if I could, Mom. It's easier to spell. Yeah. But, um, but that was the, kind of the driving force to getting you on the banjo? That and into Bluegrass because they were doing their own. And then through them, Doug Dillard was a nice mentor and Rodney both. And I'd say, where did you get that lick from? Oh, J.D. Crow. Go listen to him with Jimmy Martin. Wow, yeah. You know, Latin Scruggs or whatever they they were sending me to places to hear more music, and uh, and I went eighteen nineteen. I'm playing eight hours a day. I'm going to college, yeah. <laughs> sitting in my car practicing, uh, usually at least eight hours. Just I didn't keep track, but I remember the time going by. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had to learn. And uh, by the time I was 19, I had this dream of maybe someday I'll meet Earl Scruggs and maybe I'll record with him. I want to record Soldier's Joy with Earl Scruggs. I'll frail the banjo. Yeah. And he'll, he'll pick it. And, you know, I, that's not going to happen. Why would that happen? <laughs> but it might happen. Yeah. And when I was 19, my brother and I went to the Grand Old Opry. We worked for my father at the time. He was in the diesel equipment business. Oh, yeah. I was tired of steam cleaning diesel engines and stuff. And dad, I think we ought to, this is him talking to, to, to the father. Yeah. I think we ought to go see some of those clients and we can take the so-and-so and El Paso some, some that stuff he bought and go pick up some stuff in Missouri and then okay, take the pickup truck and go do that. Well, our whole purpose was to get to Nashville. <laughs> and we made it, maybe we can see the Grand Old Opry. Well, we got there on a hot August Saturday night and it was sold out. Oh, no. Oh. I didn't see anybody. I went to the back window and I looked in. And right when I looked at the stage, this was written. My life was written, I believe. Right when I looked at the stage, Lester Flat says, Earl and I are going to bring out Mama Maybell Carter to do the Wildwood Flower. Wow. Maybell Carter comes out. She's playing with Flat and Scruggs. And I just went, ah. <laughs> And I said to my brother, William E. McEwen, Bill, yeah. I'm going to record with, the, with one of those people someday. I don't know how. I guess I got to get a band. That'd be one way. I got to get in the music business. I got to take anyway. It was all you know. At nineteen, I was like a lot of nineteen-year-olds. I didn't know anything, but I knew everything. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it, it, it seems like dreams, but it's really pre premonitions, really, and you don't realize it at the time. But um, it's pretty amazing when you you have those moments just come true. Um, it's pretty surreal. If you follow what's in front of you, you can let it take you somewhere. Yeah. You can either watch. I remember uh, General Schwarzkopf said something when his book came out. He said, there's three kinds of people in the world. Those that watch things happen, those that make things happen, and those that don't know anything is happening. <laughs> That's true. <laughs>
I wanted to be a make things happen. I wanted to make some things. I was basically a, I was a great student. That was so what? That's your job. You're being a student. You're not supposed to get F or D, whatever. But school is ending. Hmm. I'm not ending. Yeah. Hmm. I better make something happen with the banjo, with the guitar, with the the magic shop experience. Yeah. Telling stupid jokes like the like it's the first time you've st- you've told them. You know. Yeah. I mean, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to when I get older, I'm going to open it. And maybe, maybe in this town, a little business. No, it'll be two businesses, two businesses in one building. It'll be a taxidermist and a veterinarian. <laughs> and a sign over the door will will say, "Either way, you get your dog back." <laughs> yeah. So it from. I just wanted to. to I wanted to goof off, and that's goofing off, you know. But then, then along comes playing, and then the band starts. Oh, we can get on the radio. The first record had five string banjo on it. I had a I had a mute on the banjo, but it was okay. It was still banjo. Yeah. The the, the next noticeable hit was three albums later was Mr. Bojangles, yep. which is an unbelievable. <clears throat> I played, man, I played mandolin on that. Yeah. But that was okay. The, the, but the record before, from the Uncle Charlie and his Dog Teddy album, Uncle Charlie was a very important album. Yeah. It was uh, our fifth album. We've made four others. <laughs> Duh. And uh, we needed some success. We needed some new blood. We'd been in the movie Paint Your Wagon. You familiar with that? Yeah. Well, we were listed number five on the cast, and we did Hand Me Down That Can of Beans. It was really fun. 1968. Wow. I was very young. I was 22. Hmm. <laughs> wow. So, oh, wh- 23, something like that. And uh, after that, we broke up. Oh, we got man. back four months of shooting in... Uh, in Baker, Oregon area. Yeah. And Jeff couldn't take it anymore. He said, I don't, I don't like Ralph. I don't know. Break the group up. I went off and worked for six months and anything I could. I played with Andy Williams for a month. I oh, played he's... Salt Lake, you know. Yeah. And uh, Jeff and I were at the Golden Bear, that club in Huntington Beach, watching the new group, a new group. They're called Pogo. Oh, wow. They had to change their name to Poco. Okay. Yeah. Because they were being sued by Walter Lamps with the Pogo cartoon series, the uh, animated thing. But they changed it. Yeah. And they were great. And then Jeff and I looked at each other and said, let's start the group. Let's start the group up again. Keep in mind, this is a group that had dissolved. Close the bank account, everything. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's start the group up again and record a new album. And let's get a singing singing drummer. We found Jimmy Ibbotson. Yep. You familiar with him? Yep. Well, he sang Fishing in the Dark. Yep. Uh, Recent Canadian fame. It was number one for five weeks. Good job, Ibby. Well, we found Jimmy Ibbotson, and he became the new voice. He, he had new energy. He could play country. He could play rock. He could perform. He and I worked great together. We fought it out on stage on some of the songs. Yeah. You know, fun fought it out. Yeah. And, uh, and we, well, for Uncle Charlie and his dog Teddy, we did something quite unusual for the Dirt Band. Uh, we rehearsed. <laughs> <laughs> for four months we oh. were hurt four and a half months yeah and, uh, and it was in Le- at Les's dad's Les's father repaired jukeboxes for a living oh wow 
were in a little jukebox factory yeah. rehearsing, surrounded by jukeboxes. <laughs> the irony of that escaped the dirt band, I believe, but it was really, really something. What was what was the process like when you were recording those first, say, first and second and third album? Um, where did you record? Did you record them all at the same spot, or uh, what was first your album was on at Armin Steiner's eight track, the first eight track studio in L.A. Wow, we it was right behind Capitol, that round Capitol yep. building, and we had to wait for the Beach Boys to finish, and uh, come into the control room and listen, and then get back out there and do the other song. The producer, Dallas Smith, was ordering us around. Yeah. Uh, don't touch the board. Don't get near the board, mixing boards. <laughs> you know, I mean, you couldn't. Yeah. When I met Jimmy Messina, he was producing uh, Poco's album. Wow. You know, and he was standing behind the engineer saying, could you turn up track three, please? It's like he's a little more bass. The guy looked at him. All right, here's a little more. Could you turn up track seven, please? It's the background vocals. <laughs> Jimmy wasn't in the union. Oh, yeah. It was a union-driven machine at the time. Was it? Could you turn up track nine? Listen, it's it's already almost in the red. <laughs> you expect me to, well, you want distortion? Uh, this is Ampex 256. It doesn't, it's, it can take a plus three hit. You know, you can go into the red. Yeah. You know, and, all right. You know, and but it was like mixing by, ugh, by mail. <laughs> <laughs> and, but he produced the first Poco album, and he's in the group, and he was great. We got, we, he and I got along great. And I understand he's in, he moved from Southern California to Franklin, Tennessee last year. Wow. I get to start up those chess games again. Excellent. Jimmy's been a good friend. Now, what was it like doing, what was your question? Doing the album, yeah. the early ones, we would learn songs and we'd go in to record them. The producer would say, do that again. Okay. Or he'd say, okay, on this one, we've got a couple of musicians that are sitting in. Show them the songs. You know, people we hadn't met before. Yeah. And... I think Rare Junk was one of the best dirt band, jug band albums, an album called Rare Junk. It had more of the actual band. It was the third album. It had some very funky folk music and cool stuff. And it was a lot, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Second album wasn't fun. First album was, was the first album. Was, yeah. yeah. Just get it. One of the songs on there was one of my banjo instrumentals called Dismal Swamp. <laughs> and the producer said, okay, it's time to record Dismal Swamp. I hate that song. Let's go in and get this over with. <laughs> Is that the kind of record producer you want to work with? Let's see. Uh, no. But the fifth album, Uncle Charlie and His Dog Teddy, we had started heading towards country rock. Yeah. Without There wasn't a title for that. You know, nobody knew what country. We didn't know. It's just what we were doing. And uh, my brother produced it. It was different. We picked songs that we wanted to do. Oh, yeah. We did, we did oh, a lot of great songs. And uh, it became the uh, album that was made the Circle Be Unbroken album possible. I say that because Uncle Charlie had bluegrass. Yeah. It had a classical banjo tune. It had a Jeff singing solo with a guitar. It had Jimmy Ibbotson and Jeff doing two part harmony on some songs or like the new uh, new Everly Brothers. Yep. With the halftime drum feel behind them, you know. Yeah. And the song's going along. Tell me just one more time the reason why you must. I can't do them both. God, what am I, a trouble? <laughs> oh, I hope not. But, uh, <laughs> there were some jokes there. I just stopped. 
but Jimmy Emerson could play the drums and sing, and that was like a miracle. Yeah. So he sang. Jeff and Jimmy both sang Bojangles. People don't know that, but Jeff sang harmony the last two verses, and Jimmy sang lead. But he sang lead on some of Shelley's blues, Jimmy Ebbetson. Yep. And uh, House of Pooh Corner, which was Kenny Loggins' first recording. Oh, really? Kenny Loggins' song, you know. Yeah. People know that nowadays. They're into that type of music. Yeah. But Kenny, we'd met... It comes into the dressing room. Hey, you guys, I got some songs. I better, you want to hear some of my songs? I got some songs you can record. Here, listen to this one. You know, hey, what, about, what about this one? And he, he would do things that were, the songs were so different. Yeah. This guy is good. Hey, you come up to my house, Kenny, and uh, I'll make a demo tape of you so we can learn some of your songs. And I recorded five songs with just him and his guitar. Wow. And one was House of Pooh Corner. One was Summer Shelter. No, 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 one was uh, riding. Prodigal's Return. One was Santa Rosa. Wow. Um, anyway, and it was really great. We learned it off those tapes. Yeah, that's which great. I still have. So at that time, where were you playing? What type of gigs were you doing? Uh, were, you, were you sticking in California or were you you were heading out quite a bit in different places at that time. From the time of the first record on the radio, that put us, the way the agencies worked, now they've got a hit. They've got a hit. You want them on the show? Okay. Uh, you know, they would, you could work the record chart to make the jobs happen. Yeah. Well, we'd been going on the road in 67, 8, 9. And then Uncle Charlie came out. We've been going on the road. The first time on the road was uh, like April, Gresham County Fair in Oregon, yeah. right outside of Portland. Yep. Not a pretty sight. <laughs> Three sets a day. Yeah. Bandstand, horse race track, Midway. Over here, come in yeah, everybody got a chance. Come and win the dog, win the goldfish, win the goldfish. Band. Now kataka kataka horse race in the middle of your set. They're off and running. <laughs> From PA system. I've done a bunch of those shows. <laughs> the worst part is if you, you got the gig and you were actually on the horse track where the stage oh. the stage was on the horse track. We hadn't we hadn't progressed to that yet. <laughs> We got to some of those a yeah. few years later, where the either the stage would roll out or you'd set up on the stage, and sometimes you had the grandstand uh, twenty yards away with the track between you. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Did a bunch of those too. I thought that was a good idea. <laughs> here and put the audience here. Uh, anyway. That was what it was like when we played with Jackson 5 in 1972 or so. Wow. We opened for the Jackson 5 and ABC, what's you doing to me? You know, ABC was hot and yeah. the, the Robin song. And, and that kid that sang was really good. But uh, that was on a racetrack. Sedalia, Missouri, you yeah. <laughs> know. Wow. <laughs> 59 or 70 yeah. but uh, that's ancient history isn't it but it seems so fresh yeah and some my movement of it is sharp and uh, i think sometimes it's the middle stuff that gets lost a bit. it's that the early stuff that really makes a lot of impressions i can remember gigs from early 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 days but then there's the section in the middle there where it seemed a little hazy. And it was these, you were on a, you know, it was a machine at that point and you were just kind of going and, um, and then things change again. But um, yeah, I, I, when, when did you, do you remember getting up to Canada for the first time performing? Oh man. Oh. Yeah. Played Calgary and Edmonton at the Jubilee concert halls. Yep. They're both sold out. 
And we played them, as the years went by, we played them again and again. One night we sold out, one pair of nights, we sold out two nights in one and one night in the other. It was great. Canadian audiences were wonderful because they would accept more. They would uh, also expect more. They were very uh, astute listeners. I don't mean to say were, because you still are. Yeah. But uh, whereas Face on the Cutting Room Floor didn't make it in the States on radio, it did in Canada. Yeah. Leader Dirt Band, you know. Um, yeah, the Dirt and, Band, it, it was, they're like gods in Western Canada. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's everybody loves the Dirt Band. Uh, it's and it's definitely more of a Western Canada thing than it is Ontario or East more. I seem to. The Maritimes are good too. Yep, we did well in Halifax and uh, some of those other towns that I can't remember. St. John's, uh, Moncton, and uh, Mon- Moncton. That's the one I was, I was thinking Montclair, but it's Moncton. Yeah, and. Uh, Oh, we did it uh, on PEI, the Prince Edward Island. Yep. Uh, that, was, that was a good... We did some of those shows with Willie Nelson, too. And uh, that was always a good time. Yeah, it's just... Uh, a couple of rough ones in Canada. Well, especially if it's the winter, winter time, too. There's a couple. There's always a couple of... Yeah. You know, it's, it's a hockey rink without a good PA system or whatever. Or it's a... But there's a hockey rink in, where is that? Oh, it's up in the north. I think it's got Fort in it. Fort McMurray. Yes, thank you. Yeah. That, it's a, you know, it's a great feeling when you, you're sitting in the dressing room after sound check and the promoter comes in and says, is it okay if we add some seats? I go, yeah, how many? And we're going to try and add about 400. Is that because of ticket sales? Yeah, there's, they're just going like crazy. You know, he had like 2,200 seats sold. They needed, they could, they'd scaled the room too small. Yeah. So they, they used empty space to add, add a bunch of seats. Uh, yeah, as long as you're sharing in the blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that was a great audience. Was that, do you remember, was that Ron Sakamoto booking you guys out in the West a lot? Do you remember it? Ron, or do you remember who was promoting those shows back then? I don't think that was a Sakamoto show. No. No, I think that's pre uh, pre Sakamoto. No, we were doing we were doing Sakamoto shows then. Ron yeah. Sakamoto, a great promoter in Canada. Yeah. Bill Graham of Canada, for sure. But I don't think that one was Sakamoto. But somebody might correct me after your broadcast runs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, Anyway, it was a uh, Fort uh, McMurray was always memorable. Yeah, that's great. So, as far as performing with with the Dirt Band and and going through, you know, years and years of I mean, like album after album, and how how many albums were you involved with with the Dirt Band? Do you know? Well, all of them up through ninety two. Yeah. Then from two thousand and two. I played on, on, on one album in the late 90s, played on a couple cuts, and but that was a, something they thought they needed. Um, then in 2000, I was out of the group from 88 till 2002. Yeah. And then I came back in for 2002 till 2017 or 18. Wow. And uh, I was on all the albums that yeah. when I was there. The, that one when I wasn't there. <laughs> the amazing thing I always found about when I when I seen you perform and I've seen you perform a few times, how big a sound it was with just a few guys. Um, it was always you'd always think that there should be another four or five guys up there, but it was just a big, big, full sound you guys got, and uh, it was just. But it was a part of a a thing that you played so well together and um, it's like so seasoned and so well put together that it just, it just seemed to flow so well. But 
Um, I remember the very first time I that I saw you. I Where was that, it? When I, was it? I remember it was in Toronto, actually, and it was a, a little club in Toronto. Toronto. Could have been. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, I don't totally remember where exactly, but it could have been there. Um, and I think it was a radio station, you know, big event. But uh, but yeah, I was I was blown away. It was loud, <laughs> and it was proud, and it was just great. I mean, I just I remember leaving, just going, I can't believe the sound that you guys projected. It was amazing. What I had to do with, uh, I would trade change instruments in the middle of the song. Yeah. Start off playing guitar and end up playing fiddle. Or start off with the banjo and go to the mandolin. Or I'd play the lap slide on the song, and I only use that usually on no more than one, no more than two songs, but yeah. always at least one. You know, the, the lap slide, the steel guitar that you play. Yep. I, I play a, a six-string lap slide. It's an open tuning, no pedals, but it sounds great. Yeah. It, I don't have. I don't have to be any good. You just. I can show anybody. Hold the bar there and hit that string. Doesn't that sound like 1952? <laughs> <You> know. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it's a great little lap slide. So, you also in your career has also produced albums for your friend, Steve uh, Martin as well. Um, tell me about, about, about that project. Well, I've produced other albums, yeah. uh, about 14, um, some that nobody will hear. And they're worthy of listening too, but it's just the nature of the business. You make records and some of them get out to, 8,000 people, so we can get out to 80,000. Yeah. Uh, Steve's album came about, he called me up one afternoon when I was living in New York City and says, hey, you doing anything? I said, well, no, what's up? He says, can you come over here? I said, I'll be there in an hour. He said, I got some banjo tunes I've recorded on my computer. And uh, it's like a script, you know? I listened to these tunes. He played each one, went through it twice. He said, give me a copy of that. Okay, he gives me a copy. Let me get these back to you in about a week. Yeah. And I took them home and overdubbed a bunch of stuff on using that just as a basic track. Yeah. And I used it as a basic track to, you know, he'd play with overdubs, and then I'd, I'd drop them, I'd, I'd copy paste them. You know, yep. and have him drop drop him way down to play along with them, but I wouldn't use that in the mix. And then he'd come back in, you know, as a as a song, and and play it again. Yeah, and we have fills and stuff going along with it, and bass playing or whatever. And I sent it to him. It was maybe a couple of weeks later, and. <laughs> I, I thought it was really good. He, he writes some of my favorite banjo tunes. And uh, he, he called me, and I could see that it was him. I didn't answer. He got the tape. Hmm. He'd had the tape for one day because I, I FedExed the mixes. Yeah. I FedExed him four mixes. This is just his banjo in the computer of me overdubbing a four or five things. Yeah. He called again. I didn't answer. <laughs> but the, then I called him back an hour later. Steve, what's up? I, I sorry I missed your call. And, uh, this sounds fantastic. I didn't know my music could sound this good. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, I had his interest. And I told him, I think I should produce an album on you. This should be all your banjo music or all your music. I don't know enough songs. Well, write some more. Write four more tunes. Yeah. Or come up with four more that you can attribute to you. Anyway, so he wrote some songs, and and I produced the album, and it won a Grammy. Wow, that's fabulous. And it was really fun because uh, well, it was really good. It works because it was, the material was good. It might have helped that I got Earl Scrubs to play on one song and and 
uh, Vince Gill and Dolly Parton to sing a duet and Tim O'Brien to sing Daddy Played the Banjo. Yeah. And Gary Scruggs called me up, Earl's oldest son called me up and says, hey, uh, Steve sent me the lyrics of that Daddy Played the Banjo and could you ask him if he'd be interested in having a co-writer because he's got a couple things that, uh, you know, I'll ask. And so I asked, yeah, that'd be good. So Gary Scruggs becomes co-writer and puts some great lines in that song. Awesome. And because uh, his daddy played the banjo, Earl Scruggs. Yes. And uh, that was really that was really fun. It and must Steve, be. Go ahead. When the, when the album's done and, and it's really good. I said, Steve, this is really good. You're going to have to go on the road and play. I, I can't go on the road. I, I don't know. I'm not going to go on. Because he had comedy show where you'd have to go out and do an hour straight. Really, Steve, you don't get it. When you record an album that people like, once you start the song, you've got three or four minutes to just pick. Yeah, relax. Then after the song, you have that much comedy. The song is that much. He took a few gigs. Then he took a few more. Then he started burning it up. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it was really, uh, really interesting. Um, what was he like? Uh, as you know, you knew him as a, obviously a teenager. Did you think he was going to end up being a comedian at that point? Was he someone who yeah. was just, yeah, a comedian and he used the banjo then yeah. he used the banjo when he, when he was running out of, when it wasn't going over, he would <laughs> use the banjo to think. Oh, for, yeah. Have you ever wondered about, you know, you get into something through venturing away from the music? Yeah. As he's playing it. And then, but I knew he was going to be a comedian. I know, that's why I got my brother to manage him, or I convinced him to go look at him. And, and my brother, Bill McEwen, who managed the Dirt Band. Yes. Who passed away last September. I just saw that. Sorry about that. Yeah. So, so was he, but, uh, I mean, he, he would have laughed at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so your brother, let's talk about your brother for, for a bit. Obviously he, he had quite a amazing, uh, career. Obviously he was managing the dirt band and, and Steve, and he was worked in, in my film. Brother, my brother produced five Steve Martin movies. He produced Pee Wee's Big Adventure, wow. Pee-wee's Big Top. He produced a movie called The Big Picture, which was incredibly funny. Yeah. A little bit underplayed uh, as far as box office. He produced uh, a few other films, too. And a group called Starwood that had a hit on Columbia, who whose career dissolved because of cocaine, basically. You know, um, and other drugs just got in the way. Um then he produced uh, some early, some earlier stuff and some later stuff, and he was quite productive and influential. Did he um, did he play at all? Was he a musician? He and I used to play the, those bars, Sid's Blue Beat. Oh, that was a two month long gig <laughs> every every Friday and Saturday night. We made a hundred dollars a night. Wow. How old was I? I was 18 and 19, yeah. yeah. We did a lot of Jimmy Martin music, Carter Family music, Flatt and Scruggs music, and Dismal Stump, the song that I wrote with him. Yeah. Um, and that's the music that I brought into the early Dirt Band when it was forming. I brought, along with Les Thompson, a bluegrass influence. Yeah. <clears throat> a bluegrass influence to the other guys folk music or country blues kind of thing. Yeah. So that worked out. Awesome. Yeah, you're, I looked over your brother's credentials and what everything you had done, and I was like, wow, I just, he certainly had, you could tell he must have had a lot of drive. Um, I mean, he, he certainly did a lot, and and uh, and off, obviously from a young age, too, taking on management and then getting into film and, and all that. So, uh, uh fascinating career for him as well 24 yeah at about 24 he started yeah, amazing definitely had his own opinion yeah 
Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so I called, I called him up once. I said, this guy is writing a book about comedy, Bill. It's a comedy in the 70s and how it changed. And he wants to interview you. He wants to talk about Steve and Robert Schimmel and Steve Landisberg and, and these other people that you've worked with. And I, I tried to say it to where he wants to understand what you did or why you did it. And he goes, his response was, why should I give somebody content for a book when I know what I did and I know it was right? Just because he can't do anything but write about it, I'm supposed to talk to him? No, thanks. Don't have him call. <laughs> That's great. Well, there's truth in there, isn't it? <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> you know, I'm a publicity whore. And, uh, you want to talk? Oh, okay. Anyway. The... Um, well, you've obviously worked with so many people in, in the industry and in, in country music, especially. Um, do you have some a couple of favorites that that you worked with over the years that you could maybe share a story or two? Dolly Parton, mm -hmm. that's one. Yeah. I did about 40, I did about forty shows as her opening act, and that led to me having her come to re record with Steve Martin. So thank you. Awesome. And she didn't do it just like like that. Well, John, you send me to send me that song, and I'll see if I can sing it. And and if I do it good enough, I'll I'll let you know that you can then judge it and let me know if it's good enough. And then I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Dolly. Click. It'll be good enough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's really gonna be good. You know, um, but she was great to work with on on stage, and I, I'd play the last two songs of her set her encores that was really fun one night in hawaii she got the encore and i come out on stage and i had done really well as one of the only people that could survive opening for dolly i get an encore occasionally which i thought was that's really doing the job oh yeah you can go out your name's not on the poster and you get an encore that's what you fight for yeah. you know that's what you look for why didn't i get an encore tonight oh you know, because they didn't want to hear it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do I do to make them want to hear more? Oh, so I figured that out. But I'm out there. And we just did Rocky Top. And I'm standing on her left. She's on my right. And usually we turn to the right and go, thank you. And then turn to the left and go, thank you very much. You know, only this night she turned to the left and I turned to the right. And you might imagine that. I ran into Dolly, Dolly Parton left. You know? <laughs> I hit that one really, and I went, "Oh, I'm sorry, Dolly." He goes, "That's okay, John. It was my pleasure." <laughs> Thank, you Thank you. You know, I always wanted to introduce her. Now here they are, Dolly Parton. <laughs> she used that to get attention for her songs, and she wrote incredible music. She writes incredible music. Yes. She believes in what she does. And that's something that it's really an example of good work. Yeah, she, there's not, there's nobody like her. Um, she, you know, she's certainly one in a million and uh, can sing beautifully, and, but the, the songwriting is just spectacular. It's uh, pretty amazing. Now, nowadays in music, do you have, Anything that you're enjoying that's happening now in in 2020, 2021 that you uh, like listening to, or you you kind of stick with your favorite stuff? I haven't listened to too much new stuff. Billy Strings is really great. Mm -hmm. The kid Billy Strings, have you heard of him? I've heard the name. I haven't heard his stuff. He's an incredible player. I hope he develops to a good entertainer. And player, musician, and all that, because it takes that. You can't just Dolly Parton's an entertainer. Yes, she's uh, fun to watch. She's fun to listen to. She's whatever. Um, no, I haven't been listening to too many new things. I don't like what I 
hear necessarily of new country music, although Kelly Musgraves is a great singer and some others that don't come to mind, but I can think of them. Yeah. You know, see them on the list. Oh, yeah, she's good, you know. And uh, Clarkson, what, some girl named Clarkson. Kelly Clarkson. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is there a Kelly Musgraves? Casey Musgraves. Oh, yeah. 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 And uh, that's how much, that's how closely I follow, you know. But, um, no, it's in a strange space right now for me and new music. I like good instrumental music and players. Yeah. I like my music. I go to sleep playing on my computer. Some of my, I mean, I have it play some of my songs and old recordings. And, uh, like, I like hearing this cut I did with Jose Feliciano. Oh, wow. Now you, one of your favorite singers, uh, is one of my favorite singers, John Cowan. Oh yeah. Yeah. He, he, he came, he came when I called for my made in Brooklyn album, which was, uh, three years ago. Yeah. Album recorded with one microphone. Oh, isn't that great? That was a great microphone. Yeah. <laughs> it picked up everything. Best drum sound. I felt so sorry after this recording, those guys that set up 20 mics around the drums and let's get the snare drum right. Let's get the hi-hat. Let's get the floor tom. You know, this one microphone picked up everybody and the drums. He had to move them around a couple of times before the recording because we had to had to find the right position. It's yeah. on, Chesky Records. on Chesky Records made in Brooklyn is the album with David Bromberg, John Carter Cash, Steve Martin, wow. uh, uh, Martha Redbone, wow. a wonderful singer from Brooklyn, a Native American, John Cowan, and uh, and a few other people. Um, the fiddle player Jay Unger, the guy that did a show in Farewell. Yeah, and it was a uh, we did fourteen songs in two days. Oh, nice! I rehearsed them for four or five days before the sessions and yeah. because of one microphone that's it <laughs> yeah there's not a lot there's no punching in or anything is there <laughs> no, no overdubs uh okay is everything sounding good yeah okay here we go here we go and everybody really put out the effort you could feel it in the room yeah feel i said i told david bromberg i said on this song play that electric guitar and do one of those solos that would make me go buy the album <laughs> <You know? laughs> and he did first one the one take it was just really oh you know i played banjo guitar fiddle and mandolin on the record and other guys oh andy gessling was incredible he's a star on this record you know the name andy gessling yes i do i actually know the name for those of you out there listening that don't andy gessling is a man from the group railroad Andy Gessling was the man from the group Railroad Earth, and uh, what an incredible thing that was. And I'm living in New York, and I get an email. I see you're playing City Winery. Would you like me to come sit in, Andy Gessling? Wow. Hey, Mr. Gessling, that sounds intriguing. What do you play? I, I wasn't in tune with Railroad Earth. They were a jam. They are a jam band. Yeah, they are great. And he sends back a list: uh, sax, uh, clarinet, dobro, mandolin, guitar, zither, banjo. You know, all that stuff. I says, well, I, I think I can do without the zither and the banjo, because I have one of those. And yeah, but uh, sure. I only keep in mind I don't like to rehearse. If you know the song, you'll play. Sounds fine to me. And that's part of the relationship where three years later I said, hey, you want to make an album? And he he played the zither on the album and uh, as well as sax, dobro, mandolin. And when he played the mandolin on the bluegrass tune, uh, 
me and Matt Cartsonis, the lead singer on that song, I was singing harmony on a bluegrass tune. How did he play like Jesse McReynolds, a very complicated cross-picking thing? Sounds kind of like finger-picking. I said, oh, man, that guy's good. He passed away last year, mm-hmm. but I got to got to play with him on a project. That was great. That's awesome. Anyway. So it, you have a new book now, too, right, that I saw on your website. I have a book now, too. Yes. Yeah. It's <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to do a talking book version for next year, too. Oh, that's a good idea. No. Yeah. I'm told people want to have that. So, yeah. yes, it's on the website. A book called The Life I've Picked. And the hardest thing about writing it was coming up with a title. Oh, yeah. It's a good title. I like it. Yeah, I I do too. I have to say I do. I don't like the two pages of titles that I had. Oh, maybe this will work. Maybe that will work for the months before. Finally, it's the the night before I deliver the final manuscript to go to print. I got to come up with a title. Yeah. I'm going downstairs. I'll be up when I come up with a title. I go downstairs. Okay. What am I going to call this book about the life I've picked? There you go. The life I've picked. The life I've picked. That's it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's perfect. It just, it just, it describes you perfectly, right? You just you get the whole vibe from that that title. It's perfect. And then I had to go. Is it the life I've picked or the life I picked? Yeah. Or is it the life I have picked, or is it the life I'm picking? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's not right. Well, let me wrap up on a, a couple quick questions. And uh, I know you've you've selling into a new house there, and I'm sure you have lots to do. And oh, um, this is a definite break. Good. Uh, you you must have a pile of instruments in that truck that you you drove up. There's probably a lot of instruments in there. Um, if you had to leave with just one, which one would it be? That's not fair. <laughs> it's hypothetical. <laughs> Just one. It'll be the banjo. In that particular one? Probably the one I've been playing for 40, 50 years. Yeah. Uh, um, maybe it'll be the guitar. That was 0028, 1933. Wow. The banjo was made in 1927. Um, the banjo, probably the I, I love playing the fiddle when there's people in front of me, and it's very hard to practice. Yes, I, I know. <laughs> you know, and, uh, but I like playing the fiddle when somebody else is singing, kind of thing. Yeah. But so I wouldn't take it. In fact, I haven't played the fiddle for a month now. Yeah. It's like, oh no. I, I picked it up a week ago and I played for ten minutes. I went, "Oh, good! I can my intonation is still good." Yeah, you know. So, but yeah, the banjo to the guitar. But then, if I was going to overdub, I'd want my lap steel. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was just a hypothetical question, but it, it's always interesting to hear uh, what everybody has to say on that one. Another question, I like throwing out. Um, obviously you've played so many places over the years. Um, over 10,000. Yes. Is there any place that you've haven't played that you've always wanted to play or would want to be on your list, whether it's a certain country or a certain venue or, uh, anything that is not on the list yet? I'd like to headline a show at Carnegie hall and actually sell it out. But I don't think there's much chance of that right now, but I can play other other places that are uh, equivalent to that. Yeah. On the other hand, I played last year and a half ago. I played Twin Falls, Idaho, in a twenty one hundred seat room that's 
much better than Carnegie Hall, and I sold that out. Oh, that's <laughs> it's awesome. Like, I had my group, the String Wizards, out. I left Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, mm -hmm. as I think we mentioned, a few years ago now. Yeah. And I either play solo or with my band of guys that I call String Wizards. That's Matt Cartsonis, an incredible vocalist. Les Thompson on bass, and uh, he's an original Dirt Band player. Yeah. And John Cable, who was in the Dirt Band in the in the 70s, when we went to Russia, for instance. Yeah. And uh, we go out and do a do a good show. That's awesome. Love to see that. And you, you probably do well with the solo show as well. I'm sure that's full of stories. And solo. Playing solo is really fun because it's if, if the show has got something wrong with it, it's your fault. Yeah. <laughs> no one else to blame. Yeah. You're always blame the sound guy. That's, you know. That's the next in line. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast. Um, if someone wanted to find out uh, more about you, where are you um, active on on Facebook or any of those things? Yes, Facebook yeah. Music, John John. I don't remember. It's John McEwen Music, I think it is on yep. Facebook, and my website, which I need to pay attention to fixing up. I haven't touched it in two months. Uh, is my mother thought of the name? It's John McEwen. It's a, uh, it's I a said, good, uh, it's a good website. It looks good. I'm making a website, and I'm going to call it the name you gave. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, <laughs> adding, I'm adding dot com. Oh, oh, who's dot? <laughs> my dear sweet mother, who put up with so much, and uh, my mom, she made it to ninety one. When she turned ninety. She all she asked for was all I want for my birthday is one of those computers so I can contact all my old friends. Oh yeah, all your old friends. I got her a Ouija board. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Is that yeah. a magic shop joke there? <laughs> no, That's a fairly recent joke that I haven't been able to use for a while. <laughs> That's great. Well. Thank you uh, for spending your time and um, everyone go out and, and get your new book. Um, the book has been, it's really a fun book. It, it yeah. tells a story of a, of, of a young kid that didn't have that, anyway, that got into the music business after working in Disneyland and, and worked with a lot of people and did a lot of work and loved, I love what I do. And, uh, but I played with Leon Russell and Jose Feliciano, who I, who I mentioned, yeah. Lester Flatt, Roy Clark, a, a long list of people, you know, that, uh, and there's something to tell about all of them. And I remembered it because I never did drugs. Yeah. And that was something that seemed to, seems to pay off now. You yeah, know? for sure. I, I'm going to get myself a copy because uh, I'm fascinated with the story. I'm sure there's going to be, Lots of great stories in there. Uh, so many the people. Be on, the Will the Circle Be Unbroken album. A simple dream of this this kid asking Earl Scruggs one night, driving him back to a club yeah. in Colorado. Earl, uh, <clears throat> yeah, what is it, John? <laughs> I was wondering, you know, we had gotten to know him six months earlier. Just yeah. met six months earlier. Wow. Now he's playing close to where I live. I was wondering, would you consider, uh, would you maybe think, would you, uh, would you, what is it, John? <laughs> would you want to record with the dirt pan? And he goes, I'd be proud to. And <laughs> uh, Okay, we'll talk about more later. And then a week later, asking Doc Watson the same question, a little more like, Doc, we're making an album with Earl Scruggs. We want to know if you want to be part of it. And anyway. The Will the Circle Be Unbroken album that built from that is in the Library of Congress and the Grammy Hall of Fame and on Amazon for the last year and what is this? September, October, November, December. The last year and three months it's been in the top five on three different Amazon charts. Is it really? Wow. Thanks to Ken Burns and his show, Country Music. Wow. Episode six was called Will the Circle Be Unbroken? And I closed out the last 25 minutes. 
telling the story of that album. Yeah. So, yeah. That it's, it was a life changing album for you know it's certainly an album that you can say just the name of it that takes you back and people really remember it was a huge huge project it's really weird i didn't understand the impact until the last couple of years you know but the, it's the dark side of the banjo <laughs> you know it's like the dark side of the moon yeah and it's uh the the album that won't go away it's just it's a wonderful thing would you feel that the project that you're most proud of, or do you have something else that you feel, but obviously that has such an impact and, um, it's a very tough thing. Made in Brooklyn is an album I'm very proud of. Yeah. I put a lot of time in on making it, uh, had to reschedule the sessions two or three times, which meant calling a bunch of people and say, can you do this date instead? Cause if you're going to record for two days, you got to have everybody there. You know? Yeah. And, and uh, anyway, it worked out. They all lined up and we went in and did it. And it was, everybody knew it was a really um, special project. So I had to come up to the mark. And then my first Vanguard album, String Wizards, it's a white record. It's the best. I mean, it's, it's got a white cover, kind of not all white, but it's mainly white. Uh, it's a really good use of my banjo. Yeah. Do you, um, what picking style do you like the most? Obviously five string. Do you, I'm a, a big claw hammer banjo style fan. Well, you okay. I like three finger that's quiet and I backing up a song with little licks that come and go that help reflect the lyric. Yeah. And you know, I am going there. You know, the, yeah. don't say too much and say just enough. Or if it's frailing. Yeah. I like, I like a frail. Yeah. Love that. That's a better style. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't hear that too much. Um, and I, it's something you can do by yourself, too. Early in the style where you have rhythm and melody and a little bit of funking on the banjo and stuff like that. Excellent. So, wow. So well, we could speak for hours. <laughs> it's, uh, as I said, it's been a pleasure and uh, I hope you get settled in there. Go visit Steve Warner. Um, tell him I said hello and uh, <laughs> uh, show him a magic trick. <laughs> I think I can fool him. Yeah, yeah, you should. I know a trick that he doesn't. He probably hasn't seen. No, oh, good, good, good. He'll like that for sure. Well, thanks again. Good luck with the move, and uh, it's as I said, it's been a real pleasure. And I uh, hope we have a chance to uh, meet one day. I never met Steve Warner. I, I've no. I was in the same space, you know, in a dressing room or something once. But yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I'll send him a note too and let him know and maybe I can connect you guys. So, well, Sure, say John McEwen's your new neighbor. Yeah. And, uh, he lives two blocks from you. I was just talking to him. I'll do for that some... for sure. I'll make sure that uh, that all happens. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again and uh, have a great night and uh, I'll let you know when this is uh, all put together. And uh, just hang on two seconds. I'll just wrap this up and uh, we'll say a proper goodbye here. But uh, thanks again and it's been a real pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you. Uh -huh.